Stellar Life. Mission log number 266. One of the great things that's happening when a mom gets to teach her child early is it's really the beginning of a lifelong relationship that just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. I think one of the sadnesses of modern life when mothers don't have that time with the baby or they don't know that the baby can learn so much and so the baby is is loved and taken care of but not really stimulated very much in those households mother and baby don't really get to know each other until much later and sometimes till too late you know if you don't have enough time for your children until they get much older by the time you do have time well they don't have much time for you so i think that this early these early first six years of life this is the precious time when mothers and fathers and kids they really deserve to be cocooned and absorbing everything they can from each other because that's going to be the thing that lasts for their whole life that's what life's all about welcome to stellar life podcast get inspired and live out loud from love freedom and success to having it all here's your host coach speaker and shining star orion Ryan, you're looking good. Hello and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. This is your host, Orion. Today I have with me Janet Doman. She is the daughter of Glenn Doman, who founded the Institute for the Achievement of Human Potential in 1955. Janet became the director of the Institute in 1980. She is the co-founder of How to Teach Your Baby to Read, How to Multiply Your Baby's Intelligence, and How Smart is Your Baby. And what I learned from her, and I took the course from the Institute, I learned so much. I learned that little babies can read, they can do math, and they can learn music, and they can have incredible knowledge, even when they're tiny, like a few months old. And it just blew my mind. So Janet Doman is just an incredible person super intelligent and she creates really smart kids and smart adults and I have so much more respect for my baby's intelligence after being exposed to her teachings and the teachings of the institute so this episode is a must listen to if you're a parent and it's gonna blow your mind and now without further ado on to the show one, zero, three, hey, Janet, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. It's an honor and a pleasure having you here. Well, I couldn't be happier to be here. My God, the things I learned from you changed my whole perspective as a parent about parenting and about my baby. And even though I was a pretty open-minded individual when it comes to my perspective with my baby's ability. I was thought he's the smartest kid in the world, <laughs> but still like I learned so much and we're going to dive in and, and talk more about how to increase your baby's intelligence and even how to look at babies. But before we begin, can you share a little bit about yourself, your journey, and how did you become so fascinated with this topic? Well, I think in many ways, my life was inevitable. I was raised here at the Institutes. My father founded the Institutes in 1955. And we came here when I was six years old. It was possibly the ideal time <laughs> for, for us to change from a totally normal household and a normal neighborhood to this wonderful, wonderful place. And I just immediately dived into whatever my father was doing. I wanted to be there with him and my mother as well. So at first that was following them around while they were creating what was the first rehabilitation center in the state of Pennsylvania for stroke patients primarily, but adults, 60, 70, 80 year olds who had very severe neurological problems. And I grew up with those patients and 
eventually, by the time I was nine or 10, my father started to move from treating adults to treating children. So then I had both adults and little brain injured kids living here. It was just an absolutely, utterly wonderful place to be. It was exciting. It was it was like living in an emergency room, but a happy emergency room where people were getting better all the time. Mm. And it's true, my parents worked around the clock, but since I was a, allowed to be with them, wherever they were, whatever they were doing, they always included us. So it was a great, I couldn't have been luckier in my upbringing. And by the time I was nine or 10, you know, it was very clear to me that I was going to spend my life doing this. Wow. What happens in the mind of a nine-year-old when she comes to this decision? It was a funny thing. We had, as it happened, the winter of that year of my life, we had a very severe snowstorm, 26 inches, and that's a lot for Pennsylvania. And we had inpatients. We had lots of severely and profoundly brain injured kids. And most of our clinical staff did not live on the campus, but my family did live there. And my father basically recruited our entire kitchen staff. And then he he literally went out, Stenton Avenue where we are is a snow emergency route. He went out and recruited the men on the big snow plows that came down that snow emergency route. He said to them, look, there's nobody coming out today. Get off the tractors and come in here and help us save hurt kids. And he was so convincing that they got off the tractors and said, okay, came in and he put them to work. But when he was all done shanghaiing everybody he could, there still weren't enough hands on deck. And he turned to me and said, you know, here's what you're going to do. And I remember exactly what I thought at that moment. And that was a thought that only a nine-year-old would have. I said, gee, I'm a staff member now. I thought you'd never ask, you know, (laughs) and the snow had long gone and I was still in the children's ward doing parts of the program that I had been trained to do. And I never stopped. In fact, when my friends would come over, I would take them in and say, if you're very well behaved, I'm going to teach you how to save a kid's life. And that was a very good litmus test for my friends because the friends who said, oh, this is wonderful. Can I come back? I always had back. And the friends who said, oh, I don't want to go in there. You know, that was that was a different thing. So, yes, I, I really was. If there's anyone on planet Earth who's had a better, luckier childhood than me, I have yet to meet them. Wow. It's very rewarding. Probably made you very mature very quickly and, and very empathetic as well. Well, I'm sure it did. I went to a small girl's school and most of, I think I was the only person on a scholarship for many years in that school. And most of the girls were very well off. And, you know, I would come home and my brothers would come home from the the boys equivalent of my school. And, you know, I'm sure sometimes we said things that were frivolous or we got into silly squabbles. And my mother would just quietly say to my father, well, about that blind kid who was in this week, how is she doing? And we would fall silent and remember, (laughs) you know, where we were and those things would evaporate. So I think that's, you can't do anything better for a child than to enlist them into the adult world of doing something life-saving and important. There's no deeper respect that you can show for a child than to say, essentially, you know, there's a job for you here. And I think for my father, his crowning thing with us, I think he was a man who always said that there's enough glory for everyone. I don't have to keep it all for myself. And he made sure that we always had a piece of that glory and And we still all bask in that today, for sure. Yeah, that's a very, very important lesson. Very important lesson. So can you share with me what happened with uh, the brain injured children? How did your father cure them? What was the process? And when did you start working with well children? When we started with little 
brain injured kids. Uh, we had a great deal to learn because all of our experience up to that time had been with adults. And those adults had been well until they were 60 or 70 or 80 and had a stroke. And that's very different. It's a very different case history than a little child who has been injured in utero or perhaps during delivery or right after, who by the time they're three or four, they can't move or they can't make sounds. And they never have done that. That's a very different history than the history of a 60 year old who, who walked and talked for 60 years before there was an injury to the brain. So we had a lot to learn and we used our time well in those days because we kept, we looked at how does the well baby develop? What are the critical stages for the well baby? Not just what does he do? Because I think before us, what had been looked at in early development were to sort of catalog everything that a, that a baby does. And what we had to ask was not everything, but what are the critical points? What are the critical stages for the baby? And because we had to replicate those stages for the severely brain injured child. So that was a very, at first, difficult exercise, but in the end, it yielded very good results because we created um, the developmental profile. And that profile shows the growth and development of the brain from birth to its completion at approximately 72 months of age. It shows the critical stages for the growth and development of the, the baby. And it shows all the sensory pathways into the brain, how they develop, how they should develop, and all the motor pathways coming out of the brain. And if we are remembered for anything 500 years from now, I believe it will be for giving the world that developmental profile because it's a very wonderful evaluation tool where you can evaluate exactly where a child is, a well child or a hurt child, in the context of where he should be in his development. And then even more importantly, that developmental profile shows you, if you look at it and say, well, my child is strong in vision, but he's not so strong in his auditory pathway, it will show you exactly what you need to do to get him stronger and better and moving along faster. So that was the first thing. The second big thing, and this was by, I would say, the early 60s, by 1960, we decided that our hurt kids, by then we had hundreds of two, three, four-year-old severely brain injured kids on our program, we decided that it would be a very good thing if we began to teach them to read. We had a child, very young, very hurt child who was reading. We were very impressed by the wonderful side effects of that. How old was it? Was the child? He was probably two when he started. And by the time he was three and a half, he was a pretty good little reader. We're talking about brain injured child who's three year old and reading. Yes, yes, this was a mid brain injured child, and he by four he was quite impressive. So we couldn't look at him without saying, "Well, gee, if this little mid brain injured child can do this, we're guessing all of our kids could do this." So we began the process of uh, creating a little program at first. And when I look back on those early programs, I really laugh. They're so small uh, compared to the program we do now. But we, at first, just putting one foot in front of the other, we began to teach our two, three, and four-year-olds to read. And we immediately found two things. First, it was incredibly easy, very easy. And they uniformly, all the kids learned. The second thing we found is they absolutely adored it. It was by far their favorite thing in the whole world. So in the end, we became wildly enthusiastic about doing it primarily because we said, look, these are kids who have to get up every day and fight so hard for a living. 
And here's something that they're really good at and that they love. So they deserve this. So I, I think really that the, the fact that they could read was a, a kind of nice side effect of a program that really made our kids so joyous and so happy. So that began. And once it began, we had to start looking at the well kids across the street who were seven and eight years old and often failing to learn to read and say to ourselves, why are our three-year-old brain injured kids learning to read? And the well child is not being given this opportunity. And if he fails to learn to read in school, uh, you know, pretty much if you can't read in school, you're looking at 12 years of misery. So we, in 1963, we kind of booted my dad out and said, you have a week, go write the book. And <laughs> I think it took him two weeks, but it was difficult for him because writing is lonely work and he is not somebody who likes to be alone. But we sort of held his feet to the fire. He wrote the book. He ended up taking it to Random House. And uh, the editors at Random House absolutely loved the book. They realized how important it was because he would literally be, be creating the next generation of readers for Random House. <laughs> so <Right. laughs> the book came out and the book was a very big hit, not only here in the United States. Which book was that? This is How to Teach Your Baby to Read. Mm. And not only here, but when it came out in Great Britain, it was even a bigger hit. And I think this is because the British were a bit more literate than Americans. I'm sure they still are. And we got hundreds of letters from the English moms when the book came out saying, thank goodness somebody realizes that little kids are smart and can read. I taught my kid to read 30 years ago and He's a super reader and went all the way through college and university without effort at all. So we got a lot of letters like that from our English mothers. But I have to say to this day, the feedback on that book, and now it's in 23, 24 languages, has always been amazing. What a little bit of teaching a child to read at an early age can have such a profound effect on the trajectory of a child's life. Mm. Why do young children, why are they so capable to read at, at this very young age? How old is the youngest child that you taught how to read? Well, we start actually as soon as a child can differentiate detail. When the baby, and you've been through this so you know, there comes a moment when the baby can see mom's face And if mom smiles, the baby smiles back. For the average baby, that's probably three months. Our babies, it's a good bit sooner because we give them visual stimulation from birth. But by three months, the average baby, if you make the print big enough, he can easily differentiate the word mommy from the word banana. And the reason it's so easy for him is that He is a linguistic genius. He is acquiring language at a rate that is truly astonishing. He is acquiring that language through the auditory pathway, but he's equally capable of acquiring that language through the visual pathway. The difference is that when we talk to the baby, we talk in a loud, clear, and repeated way. But unfortunately, 500 years ago, when we printed the first book, We made the print very small so that the book would be easy to carry. Well, that print is much too small for the immature visual pathways of the baby. If we make the print large, the baby can see the word banana just as easily as the baby can hear the word banana. And the brain doesn't really care what pathway is used for information. The brain cares about whether the information arrives So the brain doesn't care if it's the taste of a banana or the smell of a banana or the, the auditory word banana or the visual image of the word banana. To the brain, it's all the same. The magic is the message arriving and the baby understanding the message. So it's really quite easy 
to take all those familiar words that the baby is learning so rapidly and to introduce those words in a visual form, just as you would say them. No one would think it was strange to talk to a baby. We do that naturally. And because we do that, the baby acquires language very, very rapidly. So we're really just doing the same thing for the visual pathway. Mm -hmm. And Janet, can you take me through how you teach a baby to read? So you show them the, the big card with the word banana, and then what? Well, we might come back after the baby has seen maybe the fruits, the vegetables that he's beginning to eat, maybe some of the things in his room that he likes, family members. Maybe we teach him hand and belly button and bubble bath and, you know, the common things that are in his environment, that those are the words that mother is using all the time with him. Once those have been introduced, then we can come back. And if we want, we could make some couplets. We could say yellow banana and start introducing color because the baby loves, the brain loves color. So that would be easy to make couplets with color. Or we might just come back and say big banana or little banana. Again, opposites are very easy for the baby to understand and kids love opposites. So that would be a good thing to introduce as well. Then very quickly, we can start doing a simple book. And probably one of the earliest books would be a book about the baby himself. I like bananas. I like apples. <laughs> I like pears. And each page is illustrated with a nice picture of the baby with an apple or the baby with a pear. So the baby gets his first book very, very early on. And we might even make single word books of more exotic things. But it's a very easy, natural process. It's really about common sense more than anything else. And most importantly, it's looking at the baby and making sure that the things we're doing with him, he really likes. So if he really loves flowers, well, we're going to do more flowers. If he really loves uh, dinosaurs, then we're going to introduce dinosaurs. So we're really on a quest from the minute the baby arrives to answer the question, who is this baby? Who are you? And what do you want? And to the degree we can each day becomes an unfolding of that story. Mother gets to know the baby much more rapidly and she's putting him on his own path. She's not putting him on her path. She's finding out who he really is, what he really needs, what he really wants. And she's paying attention to his choices. She's giving him choices as early as possible. So he's in the driver's seat. And then she's paying attention to what he chooses. And he learns very quickly. It's good to talk to mom because she pays attention to my answers. Mm. So it creates a healthier attachment with the parent as well. Oh, a completely different relationship. Wow. And so just so the listeners will, will understand, we're not expecting the baby to read it out loud back to you. Absolutely not. First of all, we are talking about babies. They're not yet able to speak in a way that you and I understand, number one. And even if you were starting with a two or three-year-old, we would never ask our kids to read aloud. First of all, it really constitutes a test. You know, what does this say? That's a test. Little children love to learn. There's nothing they love more than to learn. But just like you and I, they hate to be tested. They see the test as essentially disrespectful. What they get from a test is, you don't think I know this. And of course, that's insulting. So we never test our kids. We never ask them to read aloud. Even when they can read rather well, we will not encourage them to read aloud because when you and I read aloud, we read much more slowly. And when you slow down the reading process, you negatively affect comprehension. You jeopardize comprehension. And 
you don't want to do that when you're teaching somebody to read. You want them to fully comprehend what they're reading, get the most out of it. So anything that would slow down a child when they're reading would not be a good thing. So we would never ask a new reader or a young reader or a beginning reader to read aloud. Hmm. What's the difference between the brain capacity to receive new information of a of a 10 months old to a year old to a six years old? That's a very good question. And I think the answer is simply that the younger you are, the easier it is to learn. Learning is an inverse function of age. So it's easier to teach a four-year-old than a five-year-old. It's easier to teach a three-year-old than a four-year-old. It's easier to teach a two-year-old than a three-year-old. And yes, it's easier to teach a one-year-old than a two-year-old. But each of those stages in development is different. You know, a two-year-old isn't anything like a one-year-old. And a four-year-old is utterly different than both of them. So at each stage, you have to be sensitive to who you're talking to. <laughs> and you have to be adapting to that new human being. Because every day that you and I wake up, are pretty much the same, but every day a little child wakes up, he's different. He's changing all the time. Yes. Wow. I just, just think about my baby. It just grows so fast. Yeah. And it, it's hard for you and I to, you know, we like to get into a nice rut and do this, find a thing he loves and then do it again and again. <laughs> and that's fine for about two days. And then he's kind of looking at us like, I think we've done this before. Let's move on. And that's the hard part for you and I. Mm. So what do you do to give him more stimulation to increase? Like, I know that there is, there is also the physical aspect of increasing your baby's intelligence. Well, the physical part of our program is gigantically important. Not, as I said, not all times in a child's life are the same and can be dealt with the same way. A six-month-old will have incredible attention, interest, focus, concentration on things intellectual. He'll love reading words. He'll love pictures of beautiful things. He has great attention. But that same child, if you come back at 14 or 15 months, is in a totally different place. And now he really doesn't have time to look at 50 reading words or 50 pictures or something or even time to sit through a book. He's on the move. He's on his feet. And his life is now essentially focused on all things physical. Uh, Mother Nature has got to develop his safety on his feet. So from the moment he wakes up to the moment he goes to sleep, he's pretty much focused on being in motion, on developing his balance, developing his speed, his skill. So we have to adapt his program. The program that was great for him at six months would not be great for him at 15 months. We have to make a safe environment where he can do all the physical things he needs and wants to do, but safely, you know, padding out the living room floor next to the sofa because he wants to roll off the sofa 400 times or making the, the bottom of the stairs safer because he wants to jump off that bottom step. And it's just not safe for him to do so. So what we would say is don't prevent his development, but create a safe place where he can continue to do all the things physically that Mother Nature is really demanding that he do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, it was very important to have my baby connect to nature and connect with animals and And walk, long walks in nature, even when he just started to walk, I would, we had a park near our house, a small hill, and I would take him every day up the hill, and the first day he could only go so far, and, and a few days later he was able to go a little higher, and I would see him trying to challenge himself, it was really cute, and interacting with dogs and lizards and <laughs> whatever, animal, plant, stone, was there because I feel like they learned so much from from walking in nature and, and connecting to to what's real. We live in a very fake world. We live in a box, drive in a box, meet other people in different boxes. Like we're we don't, we're not outside enough. We don't we're not connected to Mother Earth 
enough. And I, I really, it was important to me to take him to petting zoos when he was tiny, tiny, tiny. And they're like, are you sure he's going to enjoy it when he's that tiny? I'm like, yeah, yeah I am. It's going to be great. And just to instill with him a love for animals and a respect for, for the earth. I'm 100% with you. I mean, all the students who I've ever taught, they know that I'm an animal lover. And I mean, I told every student I ever taught in my class, you know, if an ant comes across the carpet, you help him to a safe spot. You do not harm him. You do not inhibit him. You do not capture him. And I found over the years that One of the wonderful things about a really good encyclopedic knowledge program, because so much of that program begins with all things natural, reptiles, birds, mammals, flowers, trees, once our kids really get a chance to learn the names of things, it completely changes their idea of the world in which they live. And I've seen this hundreds of times in our kids. If you know that that's called a little black ant or that that's a bumblebee, a northern golden bumblebee, or you know that's a giant walking stick, then you have automatically a respect for that. That's your friend. And you not only would you not harm that insect, but you won't allow anybody else to do so either. So I think that it's a very strong proof that knowledge leads to good, not the reverse. And you're right. Our children now, today, have so little contact with nature. And this is even more true right now than it was even five years ago because of all the electronic devices. I I meet children now who have never climbed a tree. Um, I meet children who have never taken off their shoes. Uh, You know, when I was little, from April to October, we didn't wear shoes. We couldn't wait for the first day of April that was warm enough where we could take off our shoes and leave them off, you know? So I, I think we need, if we want our children to take care of this gorgeous, gorgeous Garden of Eden that we live in, then we have to introduce them to that garden as early as possible So they'll have the respect and the love for it that is completely natural if we have that database for them. If they know what that insect is called or that reptile or that flower, then it's a very, very different thing. So I think all the things you did intuitively are exactly the right things and can be tremendously enhanced and expanded with the reading program or the encyclopedic knowledge program. Yeah. One of the things that I loved doing as a child was to read. Like as soon as I found reading at age six, like everybody else, I would read every weekend. I would finish a book and I would I would just read and read and go to the library and read more books and more books. And I think I was, I don't know how old I was, maybe nine or 10, where I asked for uh, the natural encyclopedia as a gift. And I would just sit and like, I, just, I would go over the encyclopedia and learn about all those animals from all over the world. And it was my favorite thing to do in the world. So I, I guess that's why I want to, I get, and, and I used to be in the backyard back, barefoot. I'm from Israel, so lots of stray cats. So I would see the, the cats and kittens and I would pretend that I'm Tarzan and climb trees and watch the animals. <laughs> <laughs> and it brought me so much joy, and I want to give that to my son as well. Yeah, I think that one of the great things that's happening when a mom gets to teach her child early is it's really the beginning of a lifelong relationship that just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. I think one of the sadnesses of modern life when mothers don't have that time with the baby or they don't know that the baby can learn so much. And so the baby is, is loved and taken care of, but not really stimulated very much in those households, mother and baby don't really get to know each other until much later. And sometimes till too late, 
You know, if you don't have enough time for your children until they get much older, by the time you do have time, well, they don't have much time for you. So I think that this early, these early first six years of life, this is the precious time when mothers and fathers and kids, they really deserve to be cocooned and absorbing everything they can from each other. Because that's going to be the thing that lasts for their whole life. That's what life's all about. Mm, nice. You mentioned bits of intelligence a little bit. What are bits of intelligence and why is it so important to flip through them so fast? We learned again with our hurt kids that we began to look at the brain computer analogy. We've always had a lot of computer people here at the institutes. We've always attracted the early computer people and they've come to learn about the brain because they're interested in self-regulating systems and the brain is the ultimate self-regulating system. And we were interested, how did they teach the computer? And we asked many questions about this in the early days and we found that the computer people were very careful about data that went into the computer. They said it has to be precise. It has to be discreet, one thing at a time. It has to be unambiguous. You have to use the correct specific language. And you must be very careful not to put corruption into the database because that will cause problems. And the more we listened and the more we understood what they were saying, we had to look at children and say, well, how do we provide a database for our kids? We're doing this very careful job with the, with the machines called computers. But if you really look at how a child acquires data, especially in the first six years of life, it's pretty much by accident. It's very rare that somebody sits down and says, well, here are the basic things that you'd need in a database in the first six years of life, uh, that doesn't happen. And this is really the food of the cortex, just as the body needs food. And we take time and energy and we're very careful about what broccoli we pick and how we wash it and how we cut it and how we steam it just for the right amount of time. So there's lots of nutrients. We even put it on the plate very carefully. And maybe we take a taste of it and say, oh, broccoli, this is so delicious. So that we can say to our child, Let, let's eat something really healthy because we want the body to be strong and to grow and be healthy. But we should have the same concerns about the cortex, which is also growing and which also needs food. In fact, what happens, the, the cortex pretty much gets everything by accident. Imagine if we if we fed our kids by accident. If we just said, "Oh, I'm I'm a little busy today. I don't think we'll we'll go shopping. We don't need to eat today. We can eat tomorrow." Or what if we just sent our three year old out in the back of the house to say, "Well, yeah, I know you're hungry. Go out and see what you can find." This is unthinkable. Mothers spend huge amounts of time on feeding the body, and we're saying we should spend an equal amount of time, if not more on feeding the cortex. Because if a three-year-old has a choice between intellectual stimulation and eating, he'll take intellectual stimulation every time, every time. So basically when we decide, we looked at this, we started to create um, little mini databases and we began with birds because we, we'd happened to be able to find them. And so we made beautiful bird bits of intelligence, big, clear, accurate pictures. And we found our kids love them. Well, then we try, we did some insects and we found they liked them just as well. Um, we went through the animal kingdom, as you can imagine. And at some point, and this is sort of funny because sometimes you learn the most important things when you get desperate, we ran out of animals. We just didn't have any more books to cut up for our kids. So we went to the bookstores and, you know, often in the bookstore, there are books for sale and they're very frequently art books because they're expensive 
and they're large and they're very sophisticated. So they were inexpensive. They had beautiful pictures. So we took some art books, you know, maybe it would be a book of Picasso or a book of Rembrandt or maybe Cezanne. And we took them home and we started to make beautiful sets of these master works. And we found that our children just adored them. They couldn't get enough. So even though we had gotten them out of, in desperation, we learned rapidly that these beautiful, beautiful works from around the world were deeply touching to our kids. So from that day, now 45 years ago to this day, we've just been expanding and expanding. I, I don't, there's very little that our parents haven't tried at this point <laughs> and that some kids somewhere hasn't said, oh, this is my favorite, mom. I love these. Right. We got your, all the bits of intelligence that you offer from the Institute and we got them, we bought them and David is just, he's loving them. He's just so excited about it. He, he loves it. When I have two questions, one is, would it be wise just to put the word with the image? And so he can learn the animal, what it's called and how to read it. We certainly think that is a good idea. And we had the option when we printed the bits that we have published, we had the option to put the word right on the back. The ones, the handmade ones that we made here, that's what we did. But when we went to make the, the published ones, we had by then learned that the next step after teaching the name of the bird or the name of the reptile is kids want information about them. What does he eat, mom? Where does he live? What, what does he sound like? So we know that once kids start asking those questions, it's a huge job for mother to find out the answers. So we opted, instead of putting the name on the back in big print for the child, we put 10 facts on the back of each one so that when mother gets asked those questions, she immediately has an answer. And of course, it makes mom look like a genius <laughs> but she always has something clever to say. But yes, you're right. In addition to that, having, you know, if you're showing a, a pileated woodpecker, having a big reading word that says pileated woodpecker is a very good thing. And kids love that. Mm, cool. Good. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. So right now, my son is bilingual. He speaks both Hebrew and English. Yeah, his Hebrew is even stronger because we spent some months in Israel before we moved back to the States. I want to take on Spanish because we moved to Florida and I need Spanish. How do I teach my, my son Spanish when I don't know Spanish? First of all, you're bilingual and he's bilingual. I also speak Japanese and a little bit of Arabic. <laughs> oh, well, if you're quadrilingual. Then I don't think... You cannot underestimate the power of that second language. People who are bilingual have much, much, much more stimulated language areas of the brain. So when they go to learn that third language or that fourth language, they can do so much more easily than those of us who are stuck with one language. It's a huge gift to have two or three or four languages. So I don't, first of all, I don't think it'd be very difficult and secondly, I think you just approach it by combining uh, what you've learned in the reading program, because it's very powerful when you're learning a new language to teach your child to read in that language. I taught 750 Japanese mothers in Tokyo how to teach their two-year-olds English, and I did it almost entirely through teaching them how to teach their babies to read English. And by the time they were on the program for about a year, most of those kids were reading in English at a first or second grade level. And they still didn't read in Japanese because no one had taught them to read in Japanese. So I think really leaning heavily on the reading program helps a lot. And I think you can also lean on encyclopedic knowledge so that you actually take a more common set of bits instead of bits that are exotic more like the common thing, a chair, a lamp, a table. You would never use those as bits because your child knows those things in his native languages. 
but you would use those to teach a third language. Mm. And the great advantage to that is you don't have to translate. You just hold it up and say the word in the language because the kid is looking, he can see it's a chair. And I think that's a great advantage to not have to translate. Mm. Wow. Uh, wow. I'm just, I'm thinking about, I, I'm, I'm getting a little stressed out, actually. <laughs> Honestly, just thinking about teaching him a third language. Like how can, what if he'll get confused and he'll mix, his, he'll mix all the languages and people will come to speak with him in English and he's going to answer in Hebrew or in Spanish. That won't happen. The only languages that will confuse him or you will be the ones you don't speak. <laughs> I think that one thing you can do is put your different reading programs in different colors. So maybe Hebrew is in red and English is in blue and Spanish is in orange. So that's nice. Just use color so you can keep everything in the right pile. But you will find that your child is very good at knowing who he needs to speak what language to. Mm, nice. This is more for the, for the new moms and dads that are listening to us right now. Why do we need to teach an infant to crawl on an inclined ramp instead of uh, swaddling them, for example? Oh, thank you for this question. There's almost nothing more important that we could say then right at birth, the baby needs to be permitted to move. When babies are born, they can move, they can crawl. And if they're given the opportunity at birth, they will move right up mother's body to the breast. The Inuit people in Alaska have had this custom for probably thousands of years, certainly hundreds of years. What do we do in Philadelphia, PA, when a baby is born right now? We take the poor baby, we bundle him, not once, not twice, not three times, not four, five blankets are wrapped around him so tight that from the neck down, he is paralyzed. And if you take a look at the look on a baby's face when this is done to him, it is not a happy look. That baby for nine months could move. And while he couldn't move freely, he could move a lot more freely in utero, then he can move if we bundle him up in five blankets and he can't move at all. So it is a travesty to do this to the baby. It should be, honestly, it, it, it almost verges on criminal stupidity um, to take the baby and absolutely prevent him from moving, paralyze him from the neck down. I did that and I didn't know better. I thought, oh my God, I'm doing the best thing for my baby. This is what of everybody course. else are doing. And there are, there are experts in books that tell you to swaddle them. It makes them comfortable. They feel like they're in the womb. And, and actually, when I did swaddle my baby, he slept a little better. So what do you think about that? I think, of course, the baby sleeps. What are his options? <laughs> If I did that to you, you would sleep. But for me to make a, a virtue of that, see... It goes back to the thinking way of the first 12 months of life. Basically, if we see the first 12 months of life as, okay, the baby, he doesn't understand anything and he can't really move. And there's really not much to do with him. The more he sleeps, the better, because then I can get my work done. And then he's not crying. And then I know he's okay. So it's all about put him in a wheelchair, bundle him up, hope he's going to sleep. It's the same thing we do to the elderly. We put them in wheelchairs, bundle them up and medicate them. And then they're not such a pain in the neck. They're not complaining. Really, honestly, babies should be interviewed <laughs> and asked, would you like to be paralyzed from the neck down or would you prefer to be moving freely at will? Because I think if you ask 10, peop 10 total strangers, which do you think you'd prefer? I'm going to paralyze you from the neck down or I'm going to let you move any way you want and you can move freely. I think this is what's commonly called a no-brainer. Babies have a birthright to move and preventing them from moving is the worst thing we could do because we convince them that they can't move. The modern baby 
that is prevented from moving because he is bundled up and then he is put in a car seat, then he is put in a pack on mother's back, then he is put in a car seat and tied in. He spends most of his day immobilized when he needs desperately to be able to move. And when he can move, he does move. And the more he moves, the deeper he breathes and the more oxygen he gets to the brain and the more he develops his vision because he starts to look where he's going and the better his vision gets, the more he sees and the more he wants to move. This is what is the natural process of development and anything. It's, it, it would be exactly like everyone saying, you know, when the baby's born, put him in a pitch black room. Because, you know, he's going to sleep much better if you put him in a pitch black room. By the way, he will. What will be his options? <laughs> it's the same thing, only we're, we're now depriving the visual pathway the way we're depriving the mobility pathway. Instead of that, he should be put in an environment that is user friendly. We should be saying not what's good for us and not what's convenient for us. We should be saying in the first 12 months of life, we must create an environment for the baby, a user-friendly environment that will benefit his development from the moment he wakes up to the moment he goes to sleep, and even while he's sleeping. And that environment for the newborn is a beautiful, smooth, warm, clean floor. And in this case, the baby crawling track allows him to have his own clean, smooth, warm floor. And if we elevate that floor, we will make it even easier for him to be able to, any movement he makes will help him move down that inclined baby track. And he will realize, aha, I can move. I can get myself from point A to point B all by myself. So by the time our babies are two and a half, three months old, they may be doing between 400 and 500 meters of crawling every day. Do you think those babies sleep well? They certainly do. They sleep the sleep of honest fatigue. Do you think they eat well? Of course they do. They're hungry. Do you think they have big chests and they get more oxygen to the brain? Yes, they do. Do you think they're healthier? Yes, they are. Everything improves when we get the baby moving. Wow, this is so powerful. So powerful. I wish I knew that earlier, but something that happened to my son was that, you know, as a new mom, everybody's, you know, they scare you and they're like, you have to put him on his back. He needs to be on his back. He needs to be on his back. And, um, or he, you know, he can die of SID in, in a mysterious way. And I know that for, for, hun you know, thousands of years, babies were put on their tummy going to sleep, but the new, in the last, I don't know how, however many years, this is the wrong thing to do and not the recommended thing to do. So I put him on his back and he, he developed this awful flat head. And I was, I didn't want to put a helmet on him and I would just put him on his tummy for hours and hours and hours on end because I want him to, we also did a, oh, how do you say it? Cranial sacral massage. Mm -hmm. With yes. the for the baby, which was very helpful, but I had him on on his tummy for many many hours, as much as I can, and then sometimes I had I had him sleep on his side, just so he won't because this can develop to into I feel brain damage if it becomes too severe. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think your instincts were all correct. I think you will find if you look at the earliest papers that were written probably now, give or take five years, 20 years ago, even when the advice was given radical and unproven at the time to put babies on their backs, they said in that earliest work, except if the child has a neurological problem, if the child is brain injured, you must leave him on his belly. It would be unsafe for him to be on his back. Now, that is a very curious PS on that article that they were not willing to make the radical change for the severely brain injured child. And uh, the statement that that 
might be unsafe for the brain injured child is nothing more than the truth. It would be very unsafe. I would predict, and by the way, the contention that it was sleep position that was the causative thing in SIDS has not been proven. I have my own theory of what causes SIDS, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Well, if you look at the literature, you will see that it's one of those things that got started and then it turned out that it wasn't really true, but nobody went back and corrected it. If you look up SIDS now, you will not find that there is great literature and proof on, oh, it's all about the sleep position. They have moved away from that. They have moved on to other issues. And again, I think your instincts are correct. There is no reason, absolutely no reason, from the moment a child wakes up until he goes to bed at night, there is no reason at all why that child should be on his back. He should be on his belly, free to move, supervised, of course, every second. That goes without saying. But absolutely, he should be on his belly. And it's really for mothers to decide what they think is the safest sleep position. There were many, many, many pediatricians 25 years ago when they first came out with this advice who thought it was terrible advice and said so. But now they're, you know, because of their age, they're dying off and they're being replaced by doctors who were born into a world that they were put on their backs. So it's a scary thing, but you're right to keep your child on his belly from the moment he wakes up to the moment he goes to sleep, because this is the natural posture for a baby. This is the posture from which he can move forward. This is the posture from which he can breathe more easily. This is the posture where he's not going to, if he vomits, he's not going to aspirate his own vomit. We have a very good article done by Dr. Ralph Poligra on this subject. And um, we include it. I think you probably got it in the course. And it's, it's really worth reading it. It's pretty straightforward. And he makes a very strong case for some of the dubious points that were made 25 years ago. Wow. Janet, I have so many more questions for you. Like, how do you teach your kid math and music? <laughs> and there is so many, so many more. you like, you have so much. Language development. I, I got into that a bit know. with your husband and it is a favorite of mine as well. So well, we'll just have to talk again. Yeah, you know, so many people, by the way, uh, listeners, you can go to Get Yourself Optimized and find uh, Janet Doman's episode there. It's going to be on the show notes. We're going to link to that episode too because it was mind-blowing, outstanding, just as this one is. And you shared different knowledge there. So if you want to listen to more of Janet's wisdom, please go to Get Yourself Optimized and listen to that episode as well. It's just so, so beautiful. It's episode number 303. I get yourself optimized and it's called Optimize Your Child's Brain with Janet Doman. So yeah, uh, you talk a little bit about that in the other episode. And if people cannot, you know, if they listen to this one and this one and are like, I'm sure they're overwhelmed with how incredible this information is because you know many of the listeners on get yourself optimized were commenting about how amazing this episode was so where can people go and find more about you and buy the bits of intelligence and get the books and maybe do a course with the institute what we've recently done that may be helpful we have put a little one hour master class right up on our homepage. It's free. And if you go into the homepage, it will give you a, a, a and hit get answers, the little orange button, get answers. It will, there's a little survey there. And if you say you're interested in early development, it's basically going to take you to that masterclass. And it's one hour. As I say, it's free. And I think it is a good introduction to get people started. And of course, on the website, there are many, many, it's a pretty rich, deep website. There's a great resource section. There's a, a section where you can find the books and the materials and get answers to your questions. And if you just want to talk to somebody and get your questions answered, 
there's the option to hit the button and do that. So, but I'd start with a masterclass. It might be useful. Cool. And what's the name of the website? That's I A H P our initials, the Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential, dot O-R-G. Fantastic. Before we say goodbye for now, Janet, and wow, thank you so much. You are incredible, so lovely, so soulful, and so wise. Thank you. What are your three top tips to live in a stellar life? Hmm, what a wonderful question. I would have to say, first, be true to yourself. Follow your path and nobody else's path and care about the world you live in. Everything matters. Care about it and never think something's impossible. Beautiful. Janet, thank you so much for all the incredible knowledge and the legacy that you are continuing and creating in this world. Thank you for being here and I just want to tell you that I love you. You're amazing. Thank you so well, much. <laughs> I have to say to you, I cannot, having met you and having met your husband, I cannot wait to meet your little boy. So I hope I'm going to get that opportunity sooner rather than later. It is such a pleasure and a privilege to be able to teach. And, and your husband was a wonderful student. You were a wonderful student. Even on a Zoom screen, you know, the people who are really in love with their kids you can just see it. It just comes beaming through. So I hope we're going to welcome you to the Institute sometime very soon. Thank you. I hope so too. And thank you listeners. Remember to speak your truth, be true to yourself, follow your path, care about the world you live in and have a stellar life. This is Orion. Till next time. Thank you for joining me on my mission to light people up and change lives around the world. I hope today's conversation inspires you to step up, go after the life of your dreams, and be who you want to be. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to go to StellarLifePodcast.com for show notes, transcripts, and other cool stuff. And please subscribe, review, and help spread the word by sharing us on Facebook and Twitter. Have a lovely day. And I'll catch you on the next episode.